Right, well, thank you very much, Kate. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to speak to you all this evening. In addition to my work at University College London, UCL, I also advise the UK government, the Department for Transport, as a member of its Disabled Persons Transport Advisory Committee, some of those DIPTAT, where I take the lead on research and evidence, in other words, finding evidence to support research to help to provide um, sound policy advice to the government. But also, I'm particularly interested in um, issues around people with non-visible disabilities like dementia, mental health, and so on. And that's really what led me into looking at this work. So let me take you through my PowerPoint. And then at the end, if you've got any questions, I will do my best to answer them. So I mentioned mental health. Well, it's one of those things. It's actually very hard to define. I've tried to find a, a definition, but it's really about having some form of health condition, which some in sense affects your emotion, your thinking, how you behave, or some combination of these things. Um, and it's kind of quite hard to diagnose, but I'm not a diagnostician, but anyway, but the point is about a quarter of the population have at least one mental illness. And about another 20% or so have experienced at some time in their life mental illness without not having to say a formal diagnosis. So we are talking about quite a large portion of the population. If you add in all their friends and family who support them, providing advice and guidance, then we are talking about a very significant portion of the population, not a tiny minority, but maybe 50% of the population at any one time. So please don't think we're just about a tiny minority. Now I've mentioned mental illnesses. What am I talking about? Well, the biggest one by a long way is anxiety. Now, of course, we all be anxious at times, when we're talking about it as a clinical condition, we're really talking about the long-term anxiety which kind of dominates life so that you're very worried about all sorts of situations. And what it does is it makes things like decision-making much more difficult. It can make people forgetful. It can change behavior because people get very worried about being in new situations, trying to avoid places and different situations. And so it can have quite a big impact on people's lives. Another fairly common form of mental illness is depression. Now, we can all be fed up at times, but we're talking about something rather bigger than that. We're talking about something like a, a chronic condition or long-term condition, which is sent a feeling of sad, if you like, all the time. And that can affect thinking, concentration, and also make decision-making rather difficult. So those are the two commonest, probably. There's also other things like agoraphobia, which is kind of a fear of being stuck in place you can't get out of. Um, or can't be escaped from. Post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, in other words, anxiety arising from a major traumatic event, which has happened sometime. Obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, is about having some sort of repetitive behavior as a reaction to being stressed and so on. But if you think about some things I've just said about their symptoms, you can see they can affect traveling because you might want to avoid places, and they can affect wayfinding because that can be about things like decision making and so on. And what I've tried to do in this next slide is to try and characterize the mental processes which underlie wayfinding. I think it's largely about using information from a variety of sources and then sort of taking them into the brain and taking decisions on the basis of that. So where does the information come from? Well, it can come from memory. If you've been somewhere before, um, then you might remember the route, or you may have had to learn it, and then you try and remember it as you set off. You've got to remember where you're going to for a start. You also got to remember, you know, where to turn left, where to turn right. On the other, if you're out, you can also do things like information in the environment, signposts, or maybe literally physical signposts, telling you how far it is to so and so. And you might use landmarks. It's a very common form of navigation, as I'm sure you realise, is to do landmarks. If we were in London having a meeting somewhere. You might know you've got to get to past Nelson's column and then go up the Strand or something or so on. So those are two common ways of navigating using the environment, signposts and landmarks. You can also use a map, a good old fashioned map on paper, for example, ordnance survey or uh, A to Z showing you the roads. Or you might have a map on your mobile phone or using an app to navigate the way. And finally, you can ask other people. 
I mean, I never ask anybody the way because I'm I'm a man. I don't ask people the way, but um, sensible people do if you're lost. So there's at least half a dozen. There's half a dozen examples of where you get your information from. There may be others as well you can think of. And we kind of take those all in and take our decision. Do we turn left at this point? Do we turn right? Do we get off the bus here? Is this the right bus even? So all that information, you've got to kind of do it. Now, obviously, we don't normally do that consciously. You think back to what I was saying earlier. Memory was mentioned. Decision taking was mentioned. So various mental illnesses I mentioned can affect these processes. So that's what I want to talk about tonight. Now, as a good academic, you're supposed to look at the literature. I'm just going to do this fairly quickly. So this is some not work I've done, but work done by other people about, for example, what causes anxiety when you're away finding. Well, either if you're not very good at finding your way, or you think you're not very good at finding your way, that can make you very anxious. And this may actually be all to do with your childhood experience. If you're allowed out when you were young, as I was, um, do what you like, go you like, you learn to find your way around. If you're not allowed out, then that's much more difficult. So we did some research a few years ago looking at travel by children, and we found very significant difference between boys and girls about the extent to which they were allowed out to explore the local environment, or particularly allowed out on their own. It's also about how confident you are interpreting the local environment. Are you confident you will find the information you need? Are you quite clear about the sorts of places you're going to, where you where you where you got to turn left or right? And other conditions, such as, for example, dyslexia, which is a condition associated with difficulty reading and interpreting words, that makes you very difficult to read a signpost, and that's going to make wayfinding much more challenging. And there are other things as well, I'm sure you can think of a few yourselves. So there are a whole range of um, aspects of that can cause anxiety when you're trying to find the way through a complex network, particularly if you're not familiar with it. Obviously, if you're very familiar, then it's relatively straightforward. It's an unfamiliar environment, not been there before. You've got to pick up cues. Remember the information that you've already got in your head, that you've learnt, and then pick up cues, either from the signs, the landmarks, or from your phone, or whatever. And mental health may itself, your mental health condition may affect wayfinding, for example, just being anxious can cause you to make the wrong decision to go left when you should have gone right forget to get off the bus or get off the bus too soon is quite a common issue sometimes it can kind of disrupt the whole way your thinking processes and affect your memory when you're trying to plan your route if you become disorientated that can give you kind of a variety of two or three different alternatives and you can find it quite hard to decide between them Caused by disorientation. I mean, for example, some years ago, I was in a, actually in Tokyo with a colleague. We came out of the metro station, and every route we looked, every direction we looked in was exactly the same to us. We'd never been there before. Everywhere was tower blocks. We found it very hard to orientate ourselves, and so we had to set off till we found a landmark we could recognise and match to our map. So it's not hard. Any of us can have these problems, but people with mental health conditions find these things particularly tricky and therefore potentially quite stressful. So there are various things already implied that you can do to cope with this wayfinding anxiety. For example, people are very familiar with areas often use landmarks. They remember what they've got to look out for and then take the appropriate decision at that point. But if you're not so familiar, you might rely on directional signs. And if you're in London, for example, we do have some excellent signposting part of a scheme called Legible London, which you may be familiar with, gives us sort of vertical signs on many of the streets in the centre of London, which show you the way to go. And of course, planning ahead is always very handy, and that will help you to be aware of how long your journey is going to be. The route, where you've got to make connection, if you've got to go to, say, the London Underground, you've got to know where to change from, say, the Piccadilly Line to the Northern Line, or whatever. And by planning ahead, you're more likely to make a satisfactory journey and not get lost and be very stressed out. Of course, if you are very anxious, you might avoid certain modes. For example, 
I know people who don't go on buses from outside London who don't go on bus in London because they're very worried they might get off at the right place. Very happy to use London Underground because they're familiar with the underground map and it's a relatively simple network. But buses they find quite challenging. You get quite worried they may not get off at the right place. Or you might avoid environments, dark streets, streets you think look a bit risky. And if you do that, that is going to affect your route choice and that in turn affects your wayfinding. So there are certain things you can do. And for example, if you're worried about um, getting lost, you might stick to main roads rather than going down back streets. And of course, you can use wayfinding apps on your mobile phone if you've got one and you're familiar with them, and you're happy to use them. There are various ways of coping with wayfinding anxiety. Clicking the wrong thing. Right. But however, there's not a huge amount of, I've given you some examples of kind of, which relate to what I'm talking about. There's actually very little research being done on how people with mental health conditions who've been diagnosed, have anxiety, depression, and so on, how they cope with everyday travel. And I decided I would do a survey. I didn't have much in the way of resources, but I could do it online. So I designed a questionnaire, got appropriate ethical approval as we have to. And what I did was I designed a questionnaire using software called Opinio. And that gives me a link, a URL if you like. And I was able to send that to lots of my contacts in mental health organizations, transport organizations, um, transport organizations like Transport for London, Transport Scotland, Sustrans, mental organizations like the Centre for Mental Health, and so on. And they very kindly distributed this link for me over Twitter, uh, mainly Twitter, or well, social media, mainly Twitter, also in some newsletters, some um, websites, and it got distributed. But clearly, I had no control over who received it. So I got results back. I got nearly 400 back. I had no idea I'm going to get them. 400 was actually a very pleasing number. And what I found was, and not worth surprised not to know, that it was the sample that I actually got back was rather biased towards younger people because it was online largely. And also there were more females proportionate than men than I would expect. So, and that might be because women perhaps were more willing to talk about their mental health condition than we more willing to talk than men, perhaps. But there is a survey called the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey, APMS. So what I did was I made, I used what we call weightings to make the distribution by age and gender of my sample the same as that in APMS. So that, if you like, took away some of the effects of this bias towards a sample which was basically too young and there were more females than in the overall population with mental health conditions as shown by APMS. Because I did this waiting, I had to remove anybody who hadn't told me what their gender was, i.e. male or female. And that left me with 363 responses. And those are the ones I'm going to use as the basis of my analysis, which I should talk something about tonight. Right, quick drink of water. On the right is the cover of the report that came out, and I'll talk a bit more about that at the end. Right, pressing on. This I just run through what the questions topics were. There's a copy of the first page of the question. I'm sure you can't read it. Even I can only read the top page, top line, I mean. But anyway, the question's on the mental health response. It basically said, have you got a mental health condition? Or are you looking after somebody who's got one? Or neither of these? If they take neither, I say, well, thank you very much for your interest. Just close the question. So everybody left was either had a mental health condition or was caring for somebody. And nearly all of them, only about 12 were carers. The rest were actually answering on their own behalf. The question about what having a mental health condition, how it affects our travel. The question about traveling by bus, rail, car and walking. There's nothing about um, international travel, for example, air travel. Although one or two people did give you a few comments about being anxious about air, but that was not a 
primary objective of the survey. It was about what we call domestic travel, i.e. travel in this country. The questions about initiatives to encourage more travel, for example, disabled persons rare card, do they have one? Things like, um, there are, if you live in London, you may have seen on the underground people wearing badges saying, um, please let me have a seat. Um, I was asked, you know, do any of you have that? Have you heard of that scheme even? The question about the use of mobile phones, apps for navigation and so on. Question about employment. And then at the end, her age, gender, and the type of area. Age was in age groups. Area type was um, ranging from rural areas, villages, towns, cities other than London and London. So it was a five categories of area type. Okay. Pressing on. So the first thing I can show you is the mental health of the people who responded. They all had at least one mental health condition because that was required for them to be included in the analysis. Nearly all of them, 89%, as you can see, had an anxiety of some sort. Two thirds of them, 68% or so, had depression. So um, you already see the you know, majority must have had more than one of these conditions. PTS, PTSD, 20%, OCD, 14 agoraphobia, 13, and so on. So, as I said, all of them had at least one. On average, they had about 2.6 of these conditions each. New, nearly all were anxious, and the majority had depression. They also had a few other things which come under the category at the bottom of others. So, most of it talking about anxiety, because that's the big one. Nearly all of them are anxious. In fact, if you include... Those said P, I mean, PTSD is actually a form of anxiety, which is usually separated out. And if they didn't also take anxiety, if you add those together, the ones with PTSD who didn't say anxiety, the ones with anxiety, well over nearly 100% actually had some form of anxiety when traveling, which affected traveling. Right. And of course, having these mental health conditions I've implied earlier when I started the talk has various effects. Four were identified to ask them about social anxiety. That's kind of being anxious about being in a social situation, basically anxious about other people. Having panic attacks, difficulty communicating, and a poor memory. So those are four things they were asked to identify. You see, nearly all says social anxiety, two thirds of panic attacks, and then the other two were just under a half. But if we look at I'll do a little bit about difference between men and women because I think there's some quite interesting things come out here. For example, social anxiety and impaired memory in the right hand columns, males and then females. Social anxiety, much the same. Impaired memory, much the same. But panic attacks, many more women than men had panic attacks, but more men than women had communication difficulties. And these differences are actually statistically significant. I won't go into that much of that tonight. But the point is, so there are significantly more men having communication difficulties, significantly more women having panic attacks. So we've got quite an interesting gender difference there. Now, they were given a list of 16 different sorts of anxiety they might have when traveling. And then I grouped these into five headings, and a sixth one called something else. So, and I've then put these in order. So. 84% of the respondents said they had trouble call anxiety about interacting with fellow travellers. Excuse me, I'm about to cough. <coughs> Excuse me. That was mainly about concern about other people who thought about them. Very interesting topic, but I won't go off on a tangent now because we're talking about wayfinding tonight. Needing support was about being sure that if they needed help, they would get it, that they could find help they, if they wanted it. Uh, or if they had some sort of panic attack, for example, they knew that they would not be, they get someone to come and give them assistance. The third one, this is six, seven percent, two thirds of them, six, seven percent, were anxious about some aspect of wayfinding. And that's obviously our topic for tonight. The other couple of things were need to urgent action. That was largely about if your train or bus or car broke down, you might well be in a place you didn't, were not familiar with, and you got to then find yourself lost or kind of find your way from somewhere you're not familiar with that caused a lot of anxiety 
The answer of virgin actually was the need to find a toilet, which is a big anxiety for quite a lot of people. And the fifth one, about half, was to do with uh, interacting with bus, well, staff generally, bus drivers, and buying tickets either for a machine or a person. So we're going to concentrate on wave funding tonight, as you know. And so that's two thirds of these people, which you'd say reasonably representative of the population of the country with mental health conditions, do have concerns or anxieties about wayfinding. Now let's look at what they were about. So there were four subcategories within um, wayfinding. One was feeling disorientated, i.e. just not knowing which way to go. They are, as a, for example, a junction. They just could not kind of sort out for themselves which way to go. I mean, when I'm out, well, if it's sunny day, I often just look at the sun and I then know roughly which way is north and so on. Or more active with the sun, which way is south in this country. Um, about a third of them were worried about getting lost. Another third or so were, in, were very anxious about having to take decisions about where to go. And those at a junction, they were anxious whether they had to turn left, straight on, turn right, or possibly take decisions about, is this the right bus? Is this where I get off my bus? And so on. And finally, about a fifth were just anxious about remembering where they were going to. I mean, and if you can't remember where you're going to, it's very hard to find your way to your destination if you can't remember where it is. So clearly you can write it down, but that's quite, I think quite 90% is not a huge number in one sense. That's a lot of people in another way who just have that difficulty. So, and that is associated with, say, with the anxiety or depression and so on. Looking at, again, on these five categories, or the difference between males and females, you'll notice down the right-hand column, compared with the next to right hand column. More women were anxious about all these things, but the only one where the difference was statistically significant was this one about taking decisions about where to go. 41% of females said that, 24% of men. So quite an interesting um, difference. And if you remember, I said early on, this might well be associated with things like what happened in childhood, the amount that children left out. And when I meted our research with children going out into the local environment, we certainly found that boys in this country will give much more um, freedom to go out and find their way about, and that may well be part of the reason for the difference. There are other things, other people have done research, things like brain difference between men and women, and so on. So there do some quite interesting differences, um, but certainly there are all sorts, of, but still, even though there are more women than men identifying these, there's still a quite a large portion of men who have these issues. It's not only women who have these difficulties, but there do seem to be a slightly larger proportion in all these cases, particularly about taking decisions about where to go. I invite people to give some, to write down about the experience they've had, um, just things that cause them great anxiety or panic attacks, just to give examples of issues that had when traveling, which relate to caused by their mental health condition. And I've just written down three here, which relate to wayfinding in various forms. Let me read them out to you. Effects of poor memory. A woman in her 40s said, when visiting a friend I had been to see several times before, I forgot the way, got lost, and her partner had to come and get me. Second one, feeling disorientated. I went to vote in the recent local elections. Even though I researched how to get there, I became disorientated and started getting really scared. So I turned back and came home. And the third and final one about getting lost. When I get lost, I panic and cry a lot. And when I panic, I lose the ability to speak, which makes things worse. There's another example, for example, of someone who had to go to an important appointment the following one day. And so the Previous day, she walked all the way there just to make sure she could find her way. You may mention these are all women. I basically, the, the, it tended to be the women who spoke much more about their um, mental health than the men. Part, I mean, there is evidence, which I won't be citing tonight, but it shows that say, women are much more willing to talk about their mental health condition than men, which may not surprise you greatly. So a lot more of the examples 
were from the women and the men. Not all of them, but the majority. So, as I mentioned earlier, one way you can find your way quite easily or help you is mobile phone apps. Many of us have mobile phones in our pockets and extremely useful they are if you need to find your way. About 65%, i.e. just under two thirds of the people who answered the survey, said they do use mobile phone apps when traveling. And those were based for navigation. There were one or two people who used things like apps of mindfulness, but that was very much the minority. So these were pretty well all for navigation. Slightly more men, 68% compared with women, but not a big difference. But the big difference is with age. And I don't think this will surprise you very much to see this. If you look at the youngest group, those under 31, 83% of those people under age 81 in the sample use mobile phone apps. And then a steady decrease to the people age over 61, 38%. Again, it's not zero, it's over a third, but a great deal fewer than the younger people. I mean, I don't think that surprises. I think, you know, it's quite well known that younger people are much more um, able, keen to use mobile phones. But um, it does mean there may be quite a major issue for older people, particularly when the information is all put online, for those who, you know, people don't, aren't able to use a mobile phone or choose not to, then they may have many more difficulties than those who use um, mobile phones. Now, if we're all sitting in a room, I'd probably say to you, who can tell me which is the most popular phone app on mobile phones are finding the way? But since I can't see you, you can, I hope, see me. We can't really do that. But so I did ask them which apps do you use. They were free to write it in. I didn't give them a list. And the, it won't surprise you, I think, to hear the most popular by a very long way was Google Maps. Of those who use, that's about the two thirds who use their mobile phone um, to help them navigate, 44% of those said, I use Google Maps. And that dominates. The second one is City Mapper, 12%, and then other things were things like inquiries, and either things which were specific to particular type of phones like Apple Maps. Um, or other apps similar to Google Maps, like Waze, so in City Map, but Google Maps dominates. And of course, maybe like me, I mean, I use Google Maps, I find it really helpful. I also get very worried about Google because it knows when it then tells me all the places I've been to the last month, I do get slightly worried. So I know it's tracking me. It probably knows more about me than I know about myself. Um, slightly worrying, but it's extremely useful. And of course, one of the things you do with Google Maps, you can link it with Google Street View. So for example, if you're going to a building you've never been to before, you can look at it on Google Street View and you can see what it looks like and that helps you to recognize it and find it. You could even, if you wanted to, do the whole walk on Google Street View to see all the landmarks you'd be looking out for. So it does offer a lot of um, information and it's extremely handy if you are willing and able to use it. But I do, and I'm sure some of you may share my concerns about uh, Google and what it does. Um, but I think it is quite interesting to see how many people do rely on it for helping to find the way. So one of the things I did look at were the factors, or ask them about what factors would encourage them to travel more. And I asked this about walking, traveling by bus, and traveling by train. So this is looking at walking. And I think what you'll notice is all these, this are the next two slides, the top one to always better behave than other people. That's the thing that people are, what makes people anxious, as we said before, is really what other people think about them. Um, it's a very interesting topic, but it's obviously not really a topic for tonight. Other things like less noise, less traffic, well, that is not directly to do with wayfinding, but on the other hand, if people divert away from say busy main roads to avoid noise and traffic they're going to go down back streets perhaps then that may require much more complex wayfinding than the uh, you know going down the main road toilet facilities again i mentioned that earlier people want want toilets that may well again affect people's route because that may want to go near a place where they can access a toilet better payments less clutter on the street i think is quite an interesting one um, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Then finally, one explicit about wayfinding, better signposts. So 21% said 
if there were better signposts on the street, I would walk more. And also more place to ask for help. And again, that might affect people's route choice, which in turn affects um, their wayfinding or the route they take and therefore may require a more complex route. Right, moving on to buses. Again, we see better behavior by the travelers at the top. But then we get some more about information. Clear information on board the bus about the route and the next stop. Now that's nearly half, 48% of the responses. That's what I want. If that was better information or clear information, then I might use buses more. Clear bus timetables and maps. That could be paper maps and timetables, or it could be on phones. They also want better bus drivers, clearer websites, and so on. So there are aspects of wayfinding up there. I so say it's largely about information, and if there were more clearer information, then that would help the decision making. So if you on board the bus and your bus, if you're in London and you would know that all the London buses tell you the route number, where they're going to, and the name of the next stop. Very handy, but in many parts of this country, that information does not exist. It should do, but doesn't as yet. Excuse me a minute. <coughs> so moving on to trains, a fairly similar picture, not surprising, I think. Again, top what's number one again? Better be by other travellers. But a new one comes up here, being able to contact a member of staff in person on the train. That could be about someone to go and ask for information, or it could be someone to go and ask if you need help, if you're having a panic attack, very worried about something. And that then relates to the next one, better trained staff and onboard staff, better trained station and onboard staff. And then we get the same ones we had on the bus, if you like, the clear information on board the train about the route and the next stop. I think I'm right in saying that all trains in this country have onboard information. It doesn't always work. It's not always as clear as it might be. And there may be parts of Britain which don't, but certainly where I live in Southeast England, all the trains do have that information, but it's not always as clear as it might be. And as I say, it doesn't always work. Then also other things like clearer rail timetables and so on and clearer websites. So one of the things that is required to give people more confidence to travel is clearer information, both on board buses and trains on the streets and if those things existed or were improved many people with anxieties and possibly depression would be feel free to travel so this is quite a big area we talk about quite a lot and we're talking about quite a lot of people as i said at the start with and let's just go back let's look at some of these gender differences so Five of the factors actually had a significant difference between males and females. And I've highlighted in blue where the male's figure was higher, and male was higher than the female, and in red where the female was higher than the male. So let's look at the red figures first, because what the females in the sample said they wanted was the clearer route information and next stop information on the bus and also on the train, as you can see, the second and fourth of those factors on that list of five and also being able to contact a member of staff in person when on the train so that's really about having the information to help support them taking decisions when to get off the train for example being reassured it's on the on the right train or bus for example and also being able to talk to a person the men, more men than women, were much more concerned about clutter on the street. I'm a bit surprised about that. I mean, I saw something that never really occurred to me that men would be much more concerned about clutter on the street, but that's what the figures show. And that, and that was a point of view. See, 32% of the men said that, nearly a third. Only 14% of the women. You could hypothesize why that might be. You may have some ideas. Very interested to hear them. And then finally, at the bottom, more men than women said they wanted more toilets when traveling by train and that would make them travel more um so we could if you like you can characterize here you know the difference between the men and the women is that the women is about being given confidence it's about if you like internal things whereas men is about changing the environment i think quite interesting differences there and of course the so the ones particularly the ones in red do relate to wayfinding in terms of having appropriate information when on the bus or on the train Right, so I just summed that up in pictures. So we say men want 
toilets on the trains. I don't want street clutter, either signs like that or bicycles left all over the pavement. And what women say they would help them travel more would be better information on board buses and trains and good on board stuff. I'm sorry about the picture there as well. Well, it's not actually an elderly picture. I think it's a, probably a preserved railway. But I don't have any pictures of guards on trains. The others come from my collection because um, none of the trains I've gone nowadays have guards on. But uh, I think it's quite interesting differences there and say partly it does relate to wayfinding. <coughs> Sorry, once again. Right, I'm going to finish in a minute. So let's just run through what we've talked about this evening. Well, I started by showing that wayfinding does use various mental skills, take decisions, using information. That comes from various sources, memory, science posts, well, the environment, you say, signposts, uh, landmarks or you get it out of maps or on your mobile phone or you're just going to ask somebody if you you know if you're lost and that information you put it all together into your head and you're taking decisions all the time now if you're walking along the streets of london or manchester or birmingham or your local village and you're feeling friendly, you're not conscious taking those things but in fact you are all the time if you've got mental health you might find it much harder decisions and need to be much more explicit about them, I making sure you've got information there and be much clearer about it and so on. And as I implied, mental health issues can affect these skills in various ways by both it's on memory, the ability to interpret information, the ability to take decisions based on that information. So that's really what I'm interested in here. And just various aspects of women does cause anxiety. And this does seem to be more so for women, and that may be for all sorts of reasons to do with, for example, childhood experience. There's also evidence around PTSD that more women are su subject to various sorts of um, sexual attack and so on, which does cause them PTSD, not surprisingly. And that may cause anxiety if someone's had a very bad experience, they've been attacked, for example, on a bus or on the streets. That may well cause severe anxiety, and that in turn may affect wayfinding and so on. We can talk about that in a minute if you like. Um, we do know that mobile phone apps are extremely handy for helping to find the way, and quite a large people will be with wayfinding with mental health issues do use them. Having said that, even some of those people who do use phones, mobile phones, including Google, um, Google Maps still had anxiety about wayfinding so it doesn't address all the problems even if you've got a very handy device in your pocket to help you find the way that doesn't overcome all the concerns about wayfinding and all the various apps i said google maps is by far away the most popular notwithstanding the fact that you may be like me and have anxieties or concerns about what google's up to with my information and um, we do know that and there is from my survey, at least, there is evidence that better information on particularly on board buses and trains and about the next stop and also say would would encourage more use of those modes and also better signposting and less clutter. And that clutter could include some street signs, of course. Better signposting and less clutter would encourage more walking. So I'm going to finish there. Just one more slide, I think. Um, a lot of this work's been published in the last few couple of months. So there's a list of four articles in academic journals. The top one, mental health and wayfinding, is really what I've been talking about today. So what I, tonight's talk has been very much based on that paper. Another one, next one on gender, mental health and travel. So the aspect as I mentioned about differences between men and women, that comes out of that paper. Then two others, mental health and travel behaviour, and also about policy interventions. The fifth one on that list is the report I showed you the front cover of earlier, which can be accessed. If you're interested in these things, and you can, well, the one about gender, you can actually download, and I believe this PowerPoint is going to be made available, so you can see it in there. That one might be able to download. The other ones you may not be able to. If you're an academic, you can. Um, otherwise, you may only be, you'll be invited to pay I don't know, a certain amount of money, which none of which will come to me, um, to look at them. Um, but, but the final thing at the bottom, you can contact me. I'm very happy to send you in those papers or anything else you want to know. If you want more information, 
please feel free to contact me on my email address at the bottom, r.mac at ucl.ac.uk, even though I um, well, UCL doesn't pay me anymore because I'm sort of retired. And nonetheless, that still gets to me. So, right, I think I'm going to finish there. I'm going to hand back to Kate uh, in the chair. And if you've got any questions or comments, I'm very pleased to hear them. Thank you very much.